Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the 24-hour peace wave recently held, uh, the ongoing peace work uh, for ending the war in Ukraine, and all of the activist work being done by the International Peace Bureau around the world. We are speaking with Sean Connor, who was appointed executive director of the International Peace Bureau. You can see IPB.org in October of 22. He holds a bachelor's in intercultural and critical communication studies from the State University of New York at Geneseo and a master's in intercultural conflict management from the Alice Salomon Hochschule. Prior to joining the IPB team in Berlin, he worked for the Center for Cross-Cultural Study in the US and in community development with the nonprofit Enlace Project in Nicaragua. He has been with IPB since 2020, first as assistant coordinator, then coordinator for the 2021 World Peace Congress in Barcelona, and as deputy executive director and now executive director. Sean Connor, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. It's, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the work you've been doing these recent years. Uh, talk a little bit about what this 24-hour uh, peace wave was. Sure. Well, this was the second 24-hour peace wave that we've done, the first one being last year in 2022. Uh, it is a uh, combined effort, of course, of, of World Beyond War and the International Peace Bureau uh, that we got together in, I guess, early spring of last year to, to begin to draft the ideas of. Um, and I, I think there's been previous episodes, so I won't focus so much on that one, but more on, on the more recent peace wave that we've done. Uh, but the goal, again, was was to bring together civil society activists from around the world uh, over a 24-hour period, going area by area or region by region uh, westward around the world to, to show continuous actions and activities of the peace movement, uh, bringing us together, showing unity above all else uh, in the peace movement, and also to learn from each other, to learn from the experiences and work that we're doing. Uh, the conflicts of particular interest or activity, attention uh, for those regions, and to show solidarity with one another in that so that we can all come together in our shared goal for a more peaceful world. Uh, so with that in mind, we, we had again this year uh, 12 segments that we did, two hours each that covered uh, different sort of timestamps around the world as we were going. Um, and rather than focusing specifically on one region, one thing I think we did particularly well this year as well, uh, is that we covered, I think, even a wider range of countries uh, within the speakers and participants of, of the Peace Wave. Uh, and we had, uh, for example, when, when the Peace Wave was in uh, our time zone here in Europe, we were not only covering Europe, but also parts of Africa and showing connections across those lines, uh, sort of uh, vertically, uh, throughout the world as we were going. Similarly, in, in the Americas, we were bouncing back and forth between North America and South America. Uh, and I think this, again, just it shows really how international we can be as peace activists and how we can bring our ideas together. Uh, you and I, Sean, may have been on for largely different parts of the 24 hours. I, I haven't, as we're uh, recording this show, I haven't even seen the whole 24 hours yet. But, but, what, but what I saw was wonderful. What, what sort of activities uh, were people engaged in uh, that, they, that they filmed as part of this 24-hour uh, Zoom wave? Yeah, uh, likewise, I, I haven't gotten through quite everything yet. I've, I've gone through and just tried to, to catch some glimpses into all of the segments that were happening in the, the late night hours or early morning hours, uh, our time here. But I think uh, one of the actions that always sticks out to me, uh, well, two, I would say, one would be the street actions. And, and really, it was clear in, in many parts of the world that there were people who either were live on the streets protesting or, or having rallies. Uh, or who had them in, in recent days and were collecting some of the video footage and explaining to us uh, what they were doing, what their protests were. And it's, it's nice to see those actions on the street because it shows, again, the, the public presence uh, that we are get, putting ourselves out there. We are sharing our message with people around the world. I think uh, sometimes peace movements, we, we can get caught up talking to uh, those who we already know or, you know, 
those within our networks and and we forget that we need to really spread that message more widely so i think uh, to have that as part of the peace wave also that the people are dedicated to go to the streets uh is something that enhances our work and and shows also to those activists on the ground that there is an international community supporting their actions uh in a, a physical location so i think that's really amazing um the other one uh coming in my in my free time i i I like to play music bits, and so I'm always really uh, impressed and amazed by the, the musicians that we have within the peace movement uh, who are sharing artistic forms of expression for peace around the world. And uh, there are several clips uh, from really all over the world around that, whether it be in the West Asia or Middle East region, whether it be in the Asia Pacific region, in the Americas as well, uh, having that the artistic or multimedia aspect to the peace wave is something I think that also uh, separates it from from re regular webinars, events, or, or street actions, and and also uh, provides culture, which is such an important aspect to to peace work as well. That we can embrace each other's cultures and, and learn from each other's cultures and use that as an expression of peace. I I should mention that people can go to twenty four hourpeacewave.org. That's numerals two four ourpeacewave.org uh, and watch the whole 24 hours or or part of it uh, or as, as much as they are interested in. Um, yeah, I, I saw uh, in the parts that I've seen thus far, I saw a great deal of music, but also visual artworks, uh, people creating visual artworks uh, over time during the Peace Wave and people describing intricate uh, paintings of, of symbolic depictions of war and peace um and uh a, a great deal of of variety of activities people planting peace poles in their town etc um did did you see any of those sorts of of activities i think unfortunately i i have i haven't gotten through to all of that yet uh but i i do remember from the, the peace wave in the year past as well that we we had uh, quite a few of these actions and you know it's hard to pick one or two that really jump out but i think uh yeah in general this is is just something that i'm really glad that we have as well any any form of the artistic expression and i would i'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the peace pole for example that's something I'm, I'm not too familiar with as a concept uh but i like the idea of and also you know things like this I could see serving as inspiration to other actors in other parts of the world if they, you know, watch through and they see something maybe they haven't tried before, whether it's making a mural or, or installing a peace post, something like this, that then they could bring to their activist work on local or uh, regional levels as well. Yeah, there are there are thousands and thousands of peace poles around the world that are typically little poles that say may peace prevail on earth in different languages on the different sides that can be installed anywhere and serve as at least a minimal peace monument in towns that are full of war monuments, which is, of course, virtually every town. Uh, I also saw a group in Washington state that took John Kennedy's speech uh, at American University, maybe the most peaceful speech ever by a U.S. president, one I'm just sick to death of, didn't think anybody could improve on, and they set it to music, like a uh, opera, and it was just, they, they actually improved the thing. Uh, it's really remarkable. Um, uh, any, any closing comments about the peace wave? I uh, want to ask you about some other topics. Yeah, I would just say it's it's uh, something I think everyone should should at least browse through or watch. I know we're making a highlights video, um, and and those who do have the chance to look more deeply into it, or if you're less familiar with peace activities in a certain part of the world, you know you can really even find uh, throughout the segments the the ones that interest you or the themes that interest you, and explore them a bit more and and to take it as a, a learning experience and also an inspirational one. Uh, I think that really is what the event serves best for, and I, I hope everyone has the chance to at least uh, take a glimpse on, onto all of the segments there. 
We are speaking with Sean Connor, Executive Director of the International Peace Bureau. You can check out IPB.org. Uh, one of the things about the wave, we saw a different focus in different parts of the world on opposing local militarism, local base construction, local wars, wars nearby. But still, there was this dominant interest in Ukraine and NATO and what's happening with this insane risking of nuclear apocalypse in Europe once again. Uh, IPB has been doing a great deal of work around trying to make peace in Ukraine. Can you talk about those efforts? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we came out from the beginning, as, as most peace organizations I'm aware of did as well, condemning the Russian invasion. Uh, but we've also seen as the war has, has developed now over the past uh, well, year and a half plus, uh, or the at least since the the full scale Russian invasion, I know you know many of us peace activists will also be the first ones to say this war did not begin in 2022, but it began earlier. Um, but what we what we've seen since is the the dramatic escalation uh, of the war, senseless violence and destruction, uh, with both sides seemingly still at a, a deadlock, uh, where really it's it's just producing death and destruction without much change. And so we have, uh, over the course, been pushing primarily for a ceasefire in negotiations, uh, arguing that this war, uh, if, if if it's left to continue on as a violent war, a violent conflict, uh, will be a war of attrition. It will be a war that causes more senseless violence and death and risks great escalation around the world. Uh, so with this in mind, and, and I do need to preface as well, saying ceasefire by no means uh, means that, that Ukraine will surrender uh, the territories that are occupied by Russia at the moment, uh, but it does mean an, an immediate laying down of arms, uh, that there is no more violence and killing. And this is also, of course, a political process that takes time and, and takes serious diplomatic effort to achieve, but one that is absolutely needed to protect lives uh, and support humanitarian aid uh, for the people of Ukraine. Uh, and then, of course, we're arguing for negotiations because uh, the, the way that this conflict will be solved, we are, are quite convinced, uh, will be at the negotiation table. And that negotiations must take priority over violence as a, a tactic for the solution of the grievances of both parties. Uh, so in this, we put together uh, earlier this year, I guess as, as the main main event we've been working towards, uh, it was on June fifteenth, uh, the International Summit for Peace in Ukraine, which was held in Vienna, Austria, uh, and that event brought together around six hundred uh, peace activists, around four hundred in person, and two hundred more online uh, from all around the world. Thirty two countries represented. Uh, to discuss these concerns that we have, to discuss the role of the peace movement, and to come out with a declaration for ceasefire and negotiations immediately. Uh, and to those ends, we, we had truly an amazing event, a great conference that we've come out of now uh, with this declaration, which now peace movements from around the world are sharing and spreading quite wi uh, widely, including with their elected officials, their governments, uh, to push for ceasefire and negotiations. And this was done with a huge number of groups and participants from around the world uh, coming to Austria and in the context, of course, of massive support and propaganda in, in the West for one side of that war. Uh, you, had a, you had venues cancel on you at the last minute. Uh, and you produced a statement that I've heard from some people, oh, it's not strong, we wish it were a stronger statement, and from other people, what an incredible achievement to have gotten any statement from this huge coalition of groups in this context. Uh, what did, what's your analysis? Yeah, um, the, the Western propaganda has, has been uh, seriously concerning and, and a huge setback for us, particularly in the Austrian context around this event. Uh, we were quickly dubbed to be Russian propagandists ourselves, uh, or even in, by some to be agents of Russia, uh, which is extremely concerning. Uh, now, we do know this, this type of rhetoric and polarization comes about in times of war when parties are either directly or indirectly involved with strong state support for 
uh, propaganda uh, in favor of one party or another. That being said, of course, we do understand this was uh, a war of aggression by Russia. Russia had no right to invade. Uh, regardless, we are still concerned that there were pretexts or prehistories to this conflict that we cannot ignore, that explain, but do not justify why Russia took the dramatic act to invade. And simply by, by addressing the, the history before the invasion uh, and the concerns we have on the Western role, uh, which is a concern that Russia, of course, has also expressed for many, many years now, uh, that was enough for us to be dubbed propaganda. And it's, it's, it's really quite unfortunate uh, that any, any sort of criticism of the West, uh, even when it's been supported by ex-members of the military, ex-generals, ex-members of the, the State Department of the U.S., for example, um, and countless other leading political uh, uh, figures, whether they be political or academic, actually, uh, who, who share the same perspectives that we have, uh, we are still, uh, as civil society, uh, dubbed not, uh, not capable of, of analyzing the situation, which is, is really unfortunate. And we also know, of course, as, uh, as conflicts seek resolution of some sort, uh, the prehistories or the, the preconditions need to also be addressed in order to create a just peace. Otherwise, the risks, uh, the, the violence beginning once again, uh, or continuing. Uh, so that is, you know, a, a little bit of a justification of, of sort of where we're coming from. I know many in the audience might, uh, might already be quite familiar with that as well in their context. But uh, regardless, you know, we, we know that we need to share our message and that we need to discuss our message because uh, the international community for peace uh, or, or international organizations from around the world uh, who are working for peace also have very different perspectives uh, on the war, on what needs focus, what doesn't need focus, and where we need to put our attention. Uh, that, again, was one of the main reasons we, we held the summit, is that we could bring uh, these actors together to have difficult conversations, knowing full well that we don't agree on everything, but that we as civil society and as peace activists still have a role to play in, in preventing the situation from escalating and holding our governments accountable for the actions uh, they have or have not played, uh, and in, in communicating that message in a way that supports peace. Uh, and this is how we came to our final declaration. Uh, and when we were reading it on stage, first, we, we had to, to mention uh, that it was not easy to draft. We were talking with a lot of different actors, a lot of different organizers uh, who wanted XYZ included or not included. Um, and of course, also under the watchful eye of uh, a very critical Austrian media, uh, and many Austrian actors. Uh, and so with all this in mind, we, we worked for really a compromise that was based on the bare minimum of what we can all agree on and calling for future actions to engage together, moving forward and continue working where we can together for peace. Uh, so I think we did a very good job of, of drafting a statement. Of course, it doesn't have everything I would like to include in it. It doesn't have everything others would like to include in it, but it, it is a, sort of a fundamental centerpiece of where everyone uh, more or less in the room could could find nothing wrong with what was in the statement. There was nothing they, they would want to remove, but perhaps just many things they would like to add. Uh, very well said, and I agree with everything uh, you've said. I hope a few of our listeners do, too. Um, the, the situation in Ukraine uh, seems to be ever escalating, however, and it seems that things that NATO leaders and U.S. presidents said months ago would start World War III are now simply done. Uh, and we have Russia putting nukes into Belarus, uh, the U.S. having nukes in uh, five countries in Europe, six if they go back into the U.K. as well. Uh, and we have the United States sending cluster bombs over. Uh, what do you what do you make of the of the heightening escalation, and how do we heighten the the demand for peace? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. <laughs> uh, all all of the the escalations, uh, you know, are things we knew would happen as long as the war goes on. Both sides will become more and more desperate to claim any sort of victory, even if it's not not an outright victory. 
uh, both sides sort of need to prove to their own people or to their, their supporters, their sponsors, that they have the capabilities to win this war. Uh, regardless, it's, it's clear that's not the case, and the escalations instead just create more destruction and more risk for the future. Cluster, uh, cluster munitions, uh, if, even if we are to believe uh, what, what the U.S. Uh, Defense Department is saying, that there is a, a low number of, of un, uh, unexploded ordinances, that uh, there will still be many, many left, and uh, they will continue to cause destruction in the country even after the war ends. Uh, the same, of course, is true with depleted uranium, something that was the hot topic several months ago, uh, the shells of which uh, are pro proven, uh, or, or at least many to many of us are, are shown to prove uh, birth defects in children and, and long-term health concerns for populations anywhere where they have been used. Uh, so so I think it's, it's really concerning to see this. The nuclear escalation, of course, is, uh, is one of the most concerning uh, possible areas. Uh, we know even even the use of tactical nuclear weapons, as as they like to be called, or as as the uh, the defense departments like to call them, uh, are are still nuclear weapons. They're still extremely dis, uh, destructive, and would basically uh, ring in uh, or or legitimize the use of of nuclear weapons uh, by wider parties. Uh, which is something we cannot come back from. Uh, and we know we, we need to avoid the use of these weapons. Uh, that being said, I, I did read a, a report and I've, I've heard some, some inside information I, I can't share too much more of, of track two diplomacy talks between the US and, uh, and Russia uh, on avoiding the nuclear risks. So it is good to see there, there are certain uh, actors within those societies that still are are seeking to to de-escalate at least on the nuclear level. However, we know all it takes really is is one simple mistake to be made, uh, or you know, one person to to launch those weapons to really uh, launch off something much more terrible. Uh, in terms of, of ramping up the the peace uh, the peace perspective, I think. This is something uh, we are also seeing to a certain level uh, with certain uh, allies of both sides uh, as we come to, well, wherever we are now in, in the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, and we see again that so far the offensive has not been too productive and there are insider reports that perhaps the U.S. or others might be uh, pressuring more for the negotiation table afterwards. We'll see if this is true, and of course, this uh, does not end the work that we're doing. Uh, even if both sides are, are pressured for a ceasefire or negotiations, I think civil society has a strong role in monitoring that entire process, making sure it's done in good faith, that there aren't uh, certain demands or or, uh, or roles that, that our governments are playing that would actually prevent the peace, but that they are uh, indeed uh, searching for a, a true end to the conflict um, and not just a, a pause to rearm and, and prepare for the next offensive. Uh, with that, I think also something we, we got out of uh, the summit in Vienna with and that we continue to, to be in strong contact with are states of the Global South uh, and also uh, states such as China uh, that are seeking uh, to, to push forward a peaceful uh, resolution to the conflict. So again, of course, Brazil comes into play. We had uh, in Vienna the the vice president of Bolivia, uh, who also uh, was was commenting on the need for peace uh, as soon as possible in this conflict. And I think to continue to work with these partners, also the African delegation that came to uh, Kiev and Moscow with a very similar demand that our our, our summit had made uh, to work with such governments through international civil society channels uh, is something that we absolutely have to continue to put the pressure on and move that forward uh, as, as an alternative to the continued violence. Absolutely. I, I just want to note that the day after Biden approved the cluster bombs, the day we were doing a 24-hour peace wave, the New York Times reported already that they had lied and that, that about the, the improved nature of the cluster bombs and no more duds and no more kids getting their legs blown off years later. No. And I think the lesson for everyone is not that they've suddenly started lying. 
but that they always lie and and not that they've suddenly started using something that's recklessly murderous, but that the whole damn thing is recklessly murderous. Um, and and I, I, I do know we've seen reports of low level talks on nuclear disarmament, as well as uh, reports on talks by former US officials. Uh, I think all of that is to be encouraged. And if you know of some other talks going on, uh, that is very encouraging because any time these people will talk to each other has got to help. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask for people who don't know much about it, uh, about IPB in general, um, your history and what else you're working on and how people can get involved. Absolutely. Uh, so the International Peace Bureau is an international network of peace organizations. So we, we function through membership uh, of other nonprofit organizations that are either directly working in peace or peace related issues. So this, of course, includes uh, organizations within the climate movements, uh, within labor uh, or, or workers rights movements, uh, and many others who, whose work is, of course, tied closely to the issue of peace. Uh, we also work with a, a network of individual activists, uh, those who aren't necessarily associated with any certain organization. Of course, World Beyond War is a member of IPB and, and one of our most active members. So we're, we're very glad to be uh, to continue our work with, with World Beyond War. Uh, and we have uh, we're, we're quite a historical organization. We were founded in 1891. Uh, we won the Nobel Peace Prize back in 1910. Of course, this is before many of the wars that we've uh, continued to uh, to protest against. Uh, upon our, our founding, really, we were a, a European organization, more or less, uh, despite the name international. Although, especially in recent decades, we have uh, found our membership has become more and more international. Uh, and this has also resulted in, in uh, a more international board and council uh, that's representing really a, a wide range of, of views and opinions. Uh, and of course, while we're focusing on Ukraine a lot in this moment, uh, we have a, a number of other campaigns uh, where we devote a lot of our time and attention. Uh, one is the global campaign on military spending, which every year uh, culminates in the Global Days of Action on Military Spending, or GDAMs, as we call it. Uh, and this is a, a period of around 30 days uh, where we coordinate actions uh, to raise attention, uh, educate, and also combat the excessive spending uh, on the military on a global level. Uh, so this is a campaign we've been doing now for uh, around 15 years uh, and is, is something that is increasingly needed every year as we see military spending just continues to rise. Uh, on the global level and on many regional levels, uh, while the world does not become more peaceful, and it, it immediately rejects uh, the the idea that more armaments or uh, preparing for war actually helps us to create peace. Uh, so we find this to be very important. In the U.S., this includes uh, tax day, so it is something that also you can then uh, directly address uh, your legislators and, and those who are receiving your tax money to let them know, I, d I don't want my taxes to go toward, towards war and, and, excuse me, war and destruction. Um, so this is something we will continue to do year after year. The period is usually April to May. Uh, we've also devoted a lot of attention recently to uh, the concept of common security and revitalizing the concept, which originated during the 1980s. Uh, and then uh, at, at that time, it was it was a, a project of uh, the Olaf Palma Committee, uh, which included representatives from the East and Western blocs during uh, the Cold War, uh, with the central question of asking what truly makes us safe, uh, and and how do we create security? The basic premise that they came out with was that security cannot be achieved at the expense of our adversaries, but must rather be created with them. Uh, so we took this concept last year through a report uh, with the International Trade Union Confederation and with the Olaf Palma International Center in Sweden to draft Common Security 2022. Uh, it's an introductory report for what common security should mean for the 21st century uh, and also invites collaboration or, or future research on the topic because it is sort of just an introduction. Uh, but it has a number of, of recommendations seconds uh, left, that we're already giving. Sorry? Just seconds left. Oh, okay. Sorry. 
Uh, yeah, so those those then would be two of our main projects, and I won't say too much more, but I would just say we also have regional networks that are dedicated to addressing uh, a variety of conflicts beyond just the Ukraine, Ukraine conflict going on around the world, whether it be Manipur in, North, in Northeast India or uh, Sudan with the civil war at the moment and many others. We've been speaking with Sean Connor, Executive Director of International Peace Bureau, IPB.org. Sean, thank you very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.